Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call to order the 178th meeting of the New York State Board for Historic Preservation here on the seventh floor of the New York State Museum in the library room. Uh, we will begin with the roll call. Okay. Doug Corelli? Here. Eric Krieger? Here. Wendalbert? Here. Kristen Harris? Here. J.D. Lorenzo? Carol Clark? Here. Jennifer Lamack? Here. Chuck Vandry? Uh, Wayne Goodman? Here. And Tom Max? Here. Okay, so we have a quorum. We have a quorum. Next item. next item on the agenda is the approval of the September minutes. I believe everyone has had a chance to review those. Uh, does anyone have any suggestions for changes or uh, remarks about the September minutes? Do I hear a motion to approve? Motion. Tom Maggs? Second. I'm giving the second to Kristen. All in favor? I need to close the state. As is our custom, I'd like to go around the room and have the State Review Board members introduce themselves as we change venues and there's different people in the room for each of our meetings, and I think it's important for people to know who we are. Uh, I'm the current chair of the State Review Board and a past board member. My name is Douglas Pirelli. Uh, I represent uh, archaeology on the State Review Board. Uh, the composition requires two members uh, whose focus is archaeology. I'm the president of the New York Archaeological Council, a clinical assistant professor at UB in anthropology. Uh, where I'm director of the archaeological survey. Oh, um, Council Frank, I'm your secretary. <laughs> Wynne Hallrich, I'm a former deputy commissioner for historic preservation, and I think I've been attending these meetings since the time that they were simply the committee on registers. <laughs> it was about 45 years ago. <laughs> uh, happy to happy to be back. Jennifer Lamack. I'm the Chief Curator of History here at the State Museum. Um, I came all the way up from the third floor. <laughs> <laughs> and I represent the, uh, no parking, represent SED on the board. I'm Tom Maggs, and I remember when they took the train wheels off Wentz Bicycle. <laughs> and I, they, my, I keep getting things, I'm a philanthropist. No. At 103, I'm a, philanthropist. I'm a philanthropist, so I just go to meetings and do whatever I can. But Lucy Rockefeller wants to tells me what to do, and then he says yes, and I agree with him. That's a good instruction. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Tom. Even though I thought I was going through Macy's, I was a graduate, <laughs> right. I saw so much stuff in my life. I thought you were working the room or something. Oops. Uh, Wayne Goodman, uh, I'm the director of the Landmark Society of Western New York, in, uh, based in Rochester. And, um, not pleased with the fact that the few times I get out of Rochester and Buffalo, Western New York, you guys have like 10 times the amount of snow that Rochester does. <laughs> <laughs> um, but happy, happy to be here. Beautiful. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carol Clark. I'm the assistant uh, director for, uh, for variance at the Department of State Division of Building Standards and Codes. I'm an architect. I'm I'm Kristen Herron, Program Director for Architecture and Design and Museums at the New York State Council on the Arts, and I represent that agency. I'm Carol Clark, I'm an adjunct professor in historic preservation at Columbia University and a former Deputy Commissioner at State Parks. I'm Daniel McKay, Deputy Commissioner for Historic Preservation and uh, Deputy State Preservation Officer for New York State. Daniel, uh, moving on to reports. I believe that's back to you. Sure. Um, so I apologize. Uh, Mayor, Commissioner Eric Pulisade is not here yet. Uh, he does expect to join us. Um, and uh, understandably, his, his schedule this time of year with uh, executive budget uh, preparation and the state of the state, et cetera, is, is quite busy. Um, so, anyway, apologies for his absence. Um, and it is notable that Jay DeLorenzo, who lives closer than any of us, is. The one absolute no in the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for braving all the parking. I do, do apologize for some of the difficulties with that. Um, I just want to run through a few items. Um, uh, some of this will be covered in greater detail at the awards uh, presentation later today, sort of in a, 
uh, state of the state of the division report. Uh, it has been a productive year, um, and uh, in, in, in a number of ways, uh, the support for new initiatives from uh, Commissioner Pulisay and the executive staff uh, has been uh, has been thorough and extensive. Um, I can't. I just don't think the Division for Strict Preservation has been as, uh, as supported as it is right now uh, with this administration. So I, I think we have a number of, of uh, important initiatives that are underway. Um, to, to summarize a few things, this, so this is the fourth meeting, obviously, of the State Review Board. Um, in, in, in terms of the number of nominations, uh, I know uh, there's been lamentation that this has been a, a down year. but if the slate today moves uh, uh, to um, state register listing and then down to the National Park Service, um, this program, the National Register Program, will have impacted 30 counties and over 4,700 properties this year alone. Uh, it's remarkable for a down year. That's a remarkable set of numbers. Um, and uh, you know, the staff um, has, has been working uh, short staff and with some uh, absences for the best of reasons. Uh, I just appreciate the work that you all have continued uh, to produce, uh, and I kind of thank you for weathering this uh, with, with your staff. Um, the uh, tax credit program uh, exceeded $5 billion in private investment uh, so far under the governor's uh, two terms to date, and that number continues to grow. Uh, about 80% of the application activity is coming from upstate communities, so the National Registry listing is obviously key to that, a key part of that process, uh, and the nominations that uh, you all are making uh, are certainly uh, uh, proving uh, fruitful for the tax credit program. Um, we have the Division for Historic Preservation, the Bureau of Historic Sites, has been given a, a new capital planning role for the agency. Uh, we are now responsible for the first time ever, I believe, uh, for prioritizing capital spending at the state historic sites. Uh, and uh, that's a role that we are embracing. Uh, there's been a great deal of talk uh, within the Bureau um, uh, about uh, how uh, our sense of priorities uh, can advance some significant improvements in the state historic site system. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're looking forward to uh, implementing that role, our priority projects are in for the next state fiscal year, and we have recently been asked to prepare a five-year work plan for the state historic site system. Uh, we have also uh, made a proposal to the governor's office uh, for a hundred million dollar fund uh, to uh, prepare the state historic site system uh, for the Revolutionary War anniversaries ahead uh, and for some additional commemorative anniversaries, including the completion of the Erie Canal in 2025 and the end of enslavement in 2027. So we are asking above and beyond the capital um, that uh, is, uh, has been or is considered for allocation. We have asked for a special fund for the historic site system specifically. Um, we do have a number of um, uh, uh, new staff that have come into, this, uh, come into the division. I think we've been awarded 15 critical fills over the past 18 months. Some of them have been, have been used for internal promotions. We're pulling staff off the National, uh, you know, the National Heritage Trust uh, funding account and bringing them over into civil service. Uh, but we do have a number of new staff at the division. Uh, we are now, I think, at 71 staff in size. Um, we have launched two special projects. Uh, Mike Schifferly is overseeing development uh, of the next uh, generation of the Cultural Resource Information System, the GIS-based platform that's at the center of so much of our work, and Bill Prattinger uh, uh, is going to be leading a three-year project to uh, comprehensively survey the state historic site, uh, the, the state parks system, uh, to document over 5,000 structures, historic landscapes, and archaeological sites uh, under uh, state parks ownership. Uh, this will aid with compliance, streamline compliance, capital planning, and new initiatives within the agency. The final piece here is that uh, we did reach a decision uh, to uh, merge the uh, National Register and Survey units, uh, and so uh, effective January 2nd, uh, those units will be merged uh, into one unit. Intent is to streamline um, uh, the process, uh, achieve greater consistency in that process, have staff cover smaller uh, 
uh, service territories uh, and have the public give the public uh, an easier understanding of the linkage between the survey and National Register listing uh, and, and how they can best interface with that. Uh, so that is a big change uh, and Kathy Howe will be leading that new unit. So um, for Kath, I have asked Kath to serve, uh, take on the assignment of uh, historian for, uh, for the agency. Uh, it's in support, that is a role that we be in support of um, the state park survey work. Uh, it would be to develop a contact statement for the uh, entire state park system. It would be to write, uh, document and write a history uh, of the state park system. Um, there's interest from at least one university press and a potential publication uh, and uh, take on special assignments related to the National Register Program and National Historic <coughs> Landmark Program uh, as needed. So that is a big change and I appreciate that she is uh, considering that assignment. So that's more important. Dan, do you have any sense of what the changes might be to the Chris system? Uh, and how they're going to go with that? I'm you sorry, just say no. <laughs> no, it's a comprehensive update. There are a number of efficiencies that the staff has identified just within sort of workflow and uh, time management, task management within the system itself. <coughs> it really is going to offer us the opportunity to um, develop a speedier system, uh, newer code, uh, integrate a number of program components that don't quite fit into the system right now, such as actually the Federal Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program. Um, so it's going to be a comprehensive overhaul update streamlining of how that system works. Hmm. Daniel, can I add the don't get trip? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Meet lunch today yeah. or tomorrow. <clears throat> really? Yeah. I was I was hesitant to commit you to a well, day. Well, let me know. know. <laughs> so Kathy's. Okay. okay, so our our we've been working very hard on our second generation of a it's called Trekker. It's a mobile application for a survey for large-scale reconnaissance intensive level surveys, whether it be municipalities, uh, for our park survey, et cetera. It's a good way to capture lots and lots of data from the field and from your desktop. So that's going to hopefully, if all goes well with the technology, be launched probably by tomorrow morning, keeping my fingers crossed on that. Thank you, Kathy. Well done. Well, no, well, well done. Let's make yeah, sure it technology <laughs> works. There's always a moment of finger crossing, but well done to get us there. So thank you. Okay, so that concludes our reports for now. Yes. Uh, the next item on the agenda is board business, which I think we should kick down to the bottom of the agenda until uh, more people come. J.D. Lorenzo, I hope, will give us an update on canal-related issues. And when we have more membership here, we can better discuss the dates for the future. Yeah. Now, but that takes us to the National Register reviews. Are you folks ready to jump into that? No, absolutely. Is that okay? Can we go there now? Thank you, Bill. And you're starting with the Smith House? With the Smith House, yes, and good morning. Good morning. Uh, just by way of introduction, the Sanford W. and Maude Smith House in Chatham, Columbia County, uh, has come to us by way of the Historic re uh, Home Ownership Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program. Um, the owner of the house is looking forward to submitting their part three uh, later this afternoon. So <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Uh, and also being nominated in the areas of architecture and politics <coughs> slash government for its association with Stanford W. Smith. Uh, period of significance, 1875 to 1932. And there is the said uh, Mr. Smith and Maude Smith uh, portrayed next to the uh, east elevation of the house in the 1920s. The Smith House is a late Victorian era dwelling of Queen Anne style characteristics <coughs> located in the village of Chatham. Built in the mid 1870s for Sanford W. Smith's father, Henry Smith, a carpenter and later a merchant, the house was substantially aggrandized around 1906 to largely assume its presence appearance and physical characteristics. It is two stories in height with a steeply pitched intersecting gable roof and was built into the sloping grade of the site. Notable exterior features include a prominent three-story corner tower and a broad wraparound veranda, which we see portrayed in the top slide, top right. 
Prior to its architectural reinvention in the first years of the 20th century, the Smith House consisted of a two-story main block with hipped roof and side hall floor plan with an L extending from the main block. Uh, we were able to determine this um, through this image in the uh, <coughs> upper right, which shows the Smith House. Oh, I forgot we have a pointer. No, we, oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> Just right uh, dab in the center, so the cubic mast hipped roof house. Uh, and using that image, as well as map data, we were able to figure out that the house uh, predates what was the presumed date of construction in the early 20th century that was actually um, an aggrandized building that was formerly owned by uh, Sanford Smith's father in his own childhood home, I should know. The footprint of that earlier construct, along with some interior finished features and the main block side hall floor plan, were retained at the time the dwelling was expanded, although the roof was rebuilt to reflect its present form. And really, the part of the house which we would be dealing with in the earlier is the main block and probably either the two stories or a story and a half of that East Cal. The updating campaign was in part driven by Sanford Smith's political, social, and economic ascendancy and corresponded, it appears, with his election to the New York State Senate. The house remains largely as Smith knew it at the time of his death in 1929, with minor exceptions. A few interior views. Uh, one of the first things that was conspicuous in entering the house was the staircase, and that was clearly an earlier Italian-style staircase, one of the central features retained from that earlier iteration of the building, a view of the veranda, and the beautiful uh, cabinetry in the small study or library that was added at the time of the expansion. The earliest part of the dwelling was built for Smith's parents, Henry and Rachel Smith, who came to Chatham from Kinderhook in 1874, when Smith was five years old. The elder Smith was a Columbia County native, but the couple wed in Wisconsin, where Henry Smith was working as a carpenter and shipbuilder. And uh, really, his, his function was as a Finnish carpenter, finishing the interiors of Great Lakes steamers. So, interesting uh, a job. Sanford was educated in the local schools prior to attending law school at Cornell University. Excuse me, University. Upon his graduation, Smith returned to Chatham where he distinguished himself as a lawyer, politician, and judge of considerable visibility. In 1896, Smith wed Maud Peck Harding, and shortly thereafter, the couple moved into the Grove Street house. Around 1906, they embarked on a substantial reinvention of the dwelling, transforming it from its earlier Italianate style form into a larger, more up-to-date Queen Anne style house. Uh, what was surprising is there was so much information on Smith. I mean, he would walk his dog and it would be in the paper. And yet this most significant event, the, the expansion of the house, we were never able to uh, definitively pin it in documentation. The 1905-1906 date comes from an Indian head penny that was found in the porch when they were restoring it. So a typical item a builder might leave behind as good luck. So and probably a date that, that is correct in looking at, at the architecture. The house is being nominated in association with Criterion B in the area of politics government for its direct association with the life of Sanford W. Smith, whose many accomplishments, and we cannot list them all because there are many, were serving as a New York State Senator, as first and second Deputy Attorney General of New York, and as a judge serving on the state's Court of Claims and Supreme Court. And in addition, he was a lifelong friend of uh, firefighters regionally. He was a president of the New York State Firemen's Association, and he actually gave the village of Chatham its first uh, motorized vehicle for firefighting in 1910, I believe. Smith was a central figure in the affairs of Chatham in the first quarter of the 20th century and was recognized contemporaneously for his many and various efforts on the community's behalf. An additional significance is claimed in the area of architecture um, for the house's reinvention as into its uh, current Queen Anne style form. And two uh, photos of the entrance lobby with the wonderful parquet work, uh, very shiny and burnished. And that is the Smith House. All right, now that is a different photo than is in the nomination form. And okay, this is a weird <coughs> question. Okay, yes. What does that floor mat say? Yes. <laughs> oh, well, it has to be the word assassin. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, it is in the nomination. 
I will have to say, I have to be very selective with the photography. Um, I don't want to go into detail, but uh, I probably should have blacked that out. It says something very strange, and I, it's, having a fragment of it is difficult to decipher, but you know it's not right. Okay, we're just going to leave that. Uh, other architectural questions? <laughs> well, Maud Smith continued living at the residence for 30 years after he passed away, as you mentioned. Correct. And she was responsible, as I understood the nomination, for the existing automobile garage from 1932, yes. which is also significant. Yes, which, so we terminated the period of significance yeah. with that construction of that. Yes. Other questions or comments about the Smith House? Do I hear a motion to approve? Move it. Tom Maggs moves. A second? Second. Kristen? Erica B. Erica B. Kristen? <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Any rolls your saying? Motion carries. Moving on to the Accord Historic District. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Accord. Accord. Can you want to reintroduce yourself? Yeah, it's nice to be back. Um, I had a hiatus. My son is four and a half months old. Yay. Hey. Hey. Actually, both of these projects were things that I finished before I went on maternity leave in July, so they're Definitely anxious uh, to be uh, presented here. At Don't put meeting. any pressure on us. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we'll move on here to uh, the Accord Historic District. It centers on a hamlet that developed around landings on the Delaware and Hudson Canal. The district is locally significant under criterion A and C in the areas of transportation, community planning and development, commerce, and architecture. The DNH Canal, which you can see some remnants of uh, the basin right there. That image um, stimulated the economies of the rural communities on its route by providing a more efficient and economical transportation alternative to overland routes. Unlike most canal communities which develop around blocks, Accord is a little bit unusual in that it developed around two basins created by local landowners to facilitate the export of local products and the import of domestic goods. So Schoonmaker's Basin is no longer, but this is a little bit of the Hardenberg's Basin. The district contains Greek Revival style buildings surviving from the canal era, and the use of that style in Accord reflected the modernizing effect of the canal on the pre-existing traditional rural architecture in the community. During the canal's active years from 1828 to 1829, the hamlet, which was known as Port Jackson during that period, developed into a modest but active commercial center. The businesses and artisans that served the canal, including hotels, stores, blacksmiths and carpenters, also provided jobs for and supported residents and nearby farm families. Accord transitioned from a canal community to a rail-oriented commercial and community center when the New York, Ontario, and Western Railroad was constructed along the former canal route in 1902. The railroad brought large numbers of summer tourists to the region <coughs> and improved the transportation and distribution of agricultural goods. Accord's main street took shape during the canal era and is marked by modest workers' dwellings and more elaborate merchants' homes, which tightly hug to the road. This pattern was continued with the construction of new buildings into the first half of the 20th century. Um, and it is sort of an eclectic looking main street because you see a little bit canal, a little bit railroad, and then a little bit that reflects that summer uh, era when people were coming more seasonally. Some of those earlier buildings on the main street were replaced by homes in picturesque or later bungalow styles, um, while others were expanded or modified to accommodate seasonal tourists and borders. The train also facilitated the creation of new or larger commercial enterprises in Accord. Um, and while its housing stock has largely remained, uh, these larger industrial resources have gone by the wayside in large part, um, this being the notable exception of the Anderson Feed and Coal Supply Company. Um, which is clearly crying out for some love and attention, but it's still there. So, Accord's historic center's layers of history include its 18th century settlement, the development of the canal town, the introduction of the railroad, and its reshaping into a 20th century summer community. Um, and it's seeing some new revitalization as people are having more seasonal homes there. So the nomination was sponsored by the Town of Rochester Historic Preservation Commission, and it was written by uh, Neil Larson, the consultant. Uh, there's a good map for the non-contributing parcels, but a lot of them are really big. 
Should we worry about this uh, in terms of uh, opposition and this issue about uh, this change to the National Register rules in terms of acreage versus numbers of people in the district? Well, it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. We haven't gotten any letters of objection. Great. But the public meeting was very supportive and very positive. Excellent. Uh, we actually had to get the sponsors sort of moving along because she was going around and having everyone talk about their house. Um, yeah. Is yeah. that early farmstead in one of those vacant parcels? Um, I'd have to look at it again. My, yeah. my memory of all the specific details is a little foggy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, but I know that some of those early farmsteads are on property, like they burnt down. The site. So um, I'd have to look at it. Thank you. Any other questions about that court? The canal was a closed system that acted independently of the rivers that it followed. Is that typical of the 19th century canals in this area? Um, that's my understanding, yeah. Do I hear a motion? Approved. When you got that? Second. J.D. Lorenzo is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Moving on to Lewis. I believe I have that pronunciation correct. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping down to New York City. Lewis <coughs> uh, Avenue Congregational Church, now Cornerstone Baptist <coughs> Church, is significant under Criterion A in the areas of social history for its association with the growth and development of both congregations and the surrounding community of Bedford Stuyvesant. The Lewis Avenue congregation had existed in the neighborhood since the late 1870s and built the Sunday School, the Red Building, in 1889 and the church in 1893 in response to the growth of the congregation and its services. Um, and we'll mention it more later, but the, uh, there's an education building that's also included in the nomination, um, just the other side of the church. You see there that image. The congregation hired architect Oscar S. Teal to design both buildings at the outset and then phase their construction. Their designs feature elements of the Romanesque and Gothic revival styles and create visual interest through their variety of brick and stone textures, asymmetrical towers, and pointed and arched windows. They built the Sunday School building first, temporarily using it as their church building. Teal adapted the Akron plan for the interior design of the Sunday School, which features classrooms extending from a central auditorium. The constraints of the site and the design meant that only a partial connection between the two spaces was possible, instead of the full height connection typical of the Akron plan. Um, this was a Columbia draft, and she was making a lot of how it was an Akron plan church, and we had to take a look at that a little closer. Um, it's got some of those features, but not all. By January 1893, the congregation had raised the funds necessary for their new church building. The church is typical of Romanesque revival design of the 1890s, which tended to feature smooth brick instead of the rough stonework popularized by Richardson. And the style of the church was carried into the interior, which features highly decorative rounded arches in the balcony, wood paneling, and barrel vaulted ribs. It's very beautiful. The church is also significant in documenting the transition of neighborhood from a majority white area into the most important African-American community in Brooklyn. Cornerstone Baptist Church purchased the building in 1944. Under the leadership of Reverend Dr. Sandy Ray, the large congregation was known for its participation in the civil rights movement and in local action to improve the lives of members of the African-American community. During this period, African-American churches in New York began taking on community-oriented building projects despite the challenges of obtaining funding um, and Cornerstone did much the same by creating the Cornerstone Educational Center in 1965 and 66 as a mixed-use educational, uh, institutional, and residential building. Uh, and that amplified the congregation's social mission by providing new services and opportunities, and it quickly became an important center for meetings, celebrations, and local organizing. And that is the Lewis Avenue Congregational Church. Um, it was a Columbia student tract, as I said, and it is supported by sacred sites. Questions or comments about this nomination? That is it, it's still a very active yes. community. Excellent. We have a motion. Anyone else want to make a comment or ask your question? I just wanted to say that it's very impressive and indeed significant that Governor Rockefeller spoke at the opening yeah, church service and then Martin Luther King spoke that afternoon. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well said. Would you like to second? Sure. All in favor? 
Aye. Any opposed or abstaining? <coughs> Motion carries. Thank you. On to Minerva and Daniel Deland. Deland? Deland. 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 Yeah. Fairport, no um, good morning. I have three properties to present, and this is the first one that I'll be showing you. This is the Minerva and Daniel B. DeLand House in the village of Fairport. Um, and this is a relatively important property, significant under Criterion A in the areas of social history and industry, as well as Criterion C for architecture. Uh, the sponsors of the nomination are the current owners, and one of them is the author of this nomination draft. And I don't think I need to point out which one's Minerva and which one's Dan. <laughs> the Delands, primarily Daniel, founded the Deland, Daniel B. Deland Company, also known as the Fairport Chemical Works. Um, and so what's big about that? Well, they were making saleratus, baking soda, and baking powder. Um, these items are taken for granted today, except for saleratus, uh, which is I don't think is still being produced, but um, baking soda and baking powder are now common items in baking. Um, and it's hard to imagine a time before they existed. Um, the company began, uh, the, the company literally began in the house on North Main Street before moving to a factory along the canal. Um, since we don't have a pointer, I'll have to move over here. So the land house is here. This area known as a park was part of the Deland family property, and after the well, after 1907, um, the Deland family sold it off, and now it's two residential streets named Deland A and Deland B. <laughs> um, this area here was originally part of the Deland farm, but um, early on they sold it to Minerva's brother-in-law, who opened a nursery operation on there, and the Deland factory. Leaf, it's hard to read. I think it's, it's right here. Here's the canal, and here's the factory. So literally, Daniel could walk to work, and I think he did. Um, his brother was also involved in the business. There's a very good description in the history of the, the uh, Deland Company, the Fairport Chemical Works, in the nomination. Um, I'm really happy about the work that the homeowner did. She did a wonderful job. When the Delands first moved to Fairport around 1856, their house on North Main Street looked like the image, or actually it's depicted here in the image seen in the upper left. It's a nice, modest, two-story Italian ape with a one-and-one-half side uh, story wing. Um, shortly after the birth of their fifth child, the house was expanded in 1867 to accommodate the growing family and the maid. The side wing was removed um, and sold, and I understand, I haven't been able to find it, but I understand it's still in Fairport somewhere. So next time I go through there, we're going to have to look for it. Okay. Anyway, uh, the side wing was removed and a new two-story wing was constructed. New windows were added and many of the Italianate details, such as the double E brackets, uh, were continued on the new wing. Uh, the image in the lower right shows the house in 1877. And you can barely see the barn in the lithograph. And the barn is still extant and now functions as a garage, but still has many of the historic features, such as the cupola, the horse stalls, the hay loft, and the barn doors. The house is remarkably intact, largely due to having few owners between the family selling the property in 1907 and the present owners who recently bought the house. Uh, we're looking at the west and north elevations, which show the slope of the land and the basement foundation hidden by foliage on the south side. You can see the basement clearly on the west side, which is the image on the left. It's amazing how that land just slopes right down, which um, caused a little problem for the current homeowners when they got a phone call saying that sewage was leaking into the neighbor and then they had a quick fix. They recently bought the house and 
they're not heavy owner you know, buyers regret, but they're they're learning about the wonders of an old house and what it means. So part of the reason for getting this building on the National Register is they are in an eligible census tract. Mm -hmm. So this will help them out with a lot of the repairs that they've been working on since their purchase from a few years ago. Um, here we see the entrance and the hallway. The hall is probably the demarcation line between 1856 and 1867. Everything to the left of the hall is part of the two-story 1867 wing. Um, added updates are throughout the entire property, and the facade has an early 20th century porch that spans the North Main Street entrance. Um, in the entrance, you can see the double doors in the left image. It's a wonderful staircase, and it's probably going to be one of three Italianate style uh, staircases that you get to see today. The first one you have with Bill, and I've got this one, and I'm going to be showing you another one. The top two images are part of the original portion of, well, the 1856 portion. And the bottom two are of the newer wing, that's 1867. Windows and moldings are intact. Wood floors are, mo are mostly original or in-kind replacements. And the current owners are trying to keep as much of the original ceilings and walls as they make necessary repairs. They recently found out that they have knob and tube. So they are trying to be very careful as they go through the plaster work and taking out as little as possible as they get new electricity put in. That's to code. Um, here we see the upstairs. The two slides on the left are the same room um, in the original portion of the house, and the two on the right are in the, the new wing. But I wanted to uh, really show the uh, fireplaces, and I don't I think I left it in the nomination, but uh, the homeowner was telling me that the room on the left, it's, it's a boys' room, the boys' room, uh, the boys' bedroom. And she said the windows there have etchings in them of the names of the Deland family. I tried to take an image of it, but my camera didn't work. It wasn't cooperating, so I can't show you that. But they're there. <coughs> yep. uh, Fairport is a certified local government and designated the property as a local landmark in 2010. The Deland family had a significant impact on the village through the manufacturing business that at its heyday, had over 100 employees, many of them women, and helped establish the airport as an industrial center in the late 1800s. The property's location at the north end of the village made it a historic entry point for Fairport and was recognized in the local designation as being highly intact with its elaborate porch and trim work, windows and doors, and with the original mechanical doorbell on the front door, and also we can't at the historic barn. Um, questions or comments about the Deland House? I just wanted to underscore your point that the homeowner did such a nice job of documenting the integrity of the building and also really that context of its importance in Fairport history. So just another kudos to the yeah. Well done. Yeah. All for baking, so many baking. Yeah. yeah. Do I hear a motion? I'll make a motion. Wayne? Second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Moving on to the uh, Ezra Huntington House. Yes. Uh, the Ezra Huntington House in Auburn, Peter County. Um, my next uh, presentation is a wonderful house. Um, it's one of the last two extant buildings that are associated with the Auburn Theological Seminary. The other being the Willard Chapel, which is listed as a National Historic Landmark. It's listed in 2005. Now, although not in the NHL, the Huntington House is significant under Criterion B for its association with Dr. Huntington, who served as ex officio president of the seminary and was instrumental in its success after its near-death experience prior to his arrival. The house served as his office and residence until his death in 19, or 1901. And even though it was owned by the seminary until 1953, its strongest association was with Dr. Huntington and his work at the seminary. 
Now the house is seen on the left just beyond the seminary campus. You see the green area and just next to it you, see, you can see it says E.A. Huntington. The house is also significant under Criterion C for architecture as a highly intact example of mid-19th century Italianate residential design. Built in 1861, the house features front gable and side wing form, deep eaves, entrance portico, and the stone foundation. Restrained details are attributed to either the seminary's need to be frugal, they were still climbing out of financial uh, trouble, or as being appropriate for a Presbyterian minister and a seminary professor. Okay. I'll let you take your pick. I think it's a little bit of both. <clears throat> Here again we have a house that has had few owners between Dr. Huntington, or rent at the seminary, um, and the current owners, resulting in a high degree of integrity. The most significant change to the house was the addition of a three-bay garage in the early 20th century. <coughs> Porches were repaired in kind on the west and north sides of the house. They had a lot of rotting boards and things, but uh, the owners, the current owners of the house, are, do, are, are really uh, doing what they can to keep this as intact as possible. The original floor plan is intact, um, as is much of the historic features. The few exceptions are a mid 20th century fireplace in the drawing room and early 20th century bathrooms added on both floors. Uh, here we see a current and historic view of the West Parlor in the upper images, showing the original settee, an original piece from the Huntington household. And if I remember correctly, um, either someone from the community or someone from the family contacted the owners and said, we've got this sofa, would you like it? And it used to be in the house, and they said, sure, yeah. So if you're not sure, and it is a little dark. Here's the settee. That's an original photograph from Dr. Huntington's occupation. And here it is, currently. And they try to put it in the same spot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Let's see what else we get. Um, uh, the lower left image is Dr. Huntington's office, and the lower right is the drawing room, and you can barely see the, what I call the mucked up fireplace, mm -hmm. the, the modern brick one right here. That's the only thing that, that went wrong with the house. No, it's not a deal breaker. <coughs> More interior views. Um, this slide shows the entry hall and the original main stair. Again, we have another Italianate style staircase. And one of the upstairs bedrooms and hall with a portion of the built in linen storage cabinets visible at the end of the main hallway. I tried to take um, some images of photographs of that built in cabinet, but its location of where it is, it's really hard to see. You see a little piece of it on the left. Is it really that narrow? That hallway is narrow. Wow. Um, and also to that uh, cabinet goes all the way down the wall that goes wow. perpendicular to mm. it. So I looked at it and I said, I want one of those. Right. Those people were frugal. That's a frugal hole. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been Presbyterian. <laughs> well, it does lead to the back of the house too where the servant was. So. Ah, they truly were frugal. <laughs> More so, probably with the that one. See, the pen did not help. As previously mentioned, the house is being nominated under Criterion B for its association with Dr. Huntington, who arrived at the seminary at a crucial time. The school was nearly a casualty of a major division between new and old school factions of the church. And I need not elaborate here since the consultant covered it very well in the nomination draft. He also gave a really nice, concise history of. Theological Seminary. Dr. Huntington's leadership helped to bridge the divide within the school and focus on training ministers and missionaries for worldwide ministry. He was also determined that the seminary be equipped with the proper library and saw the need to add faculty 
dividing his own position and subscribing $1,000 along with three other professors to establish an endowment for the seminary. Auburn is a certified local government and has reviewed the nomination draft and sent us uh, a document of support for listing the Ezra A. Huntington House. Um, questions, comments? Comments. I have a question. The abolition of legacy of the seminary is really abundantly clear in the nomination, but Huntington's personal beliefs are inferred to be similar to those of the seminary and Reverend Knott, but it was, my takeaway was that it's really not fully known where he came down. Do you agree with that? I do, and I think there needs to be more um, research done. And also, too, um, there's been some wondering if there's a portion of the, the uh, attic area if this might have been um, part of the Underground Railroad. So they really need to do a lot more documentation. They've been trying to use Judy Wellman's um, MPDFs and other documents, but they haven't been able to really find anything definitive. Um, and part of it, it too, is the date of 1861. So you know, they picked up before starting. Um, it doesn't mean that there weren't uh, freedom seekers still coming north, they probably were. But um, what did that mean? And also, too, there was a division within the school themselves about, you know, should we be doing this? Should we not be doing this? So I, I think what we're focusing on here is the house and Dr. Huntington and um, the, the resource itself. I, I so hopefully question. they'll be able to come up with some more information and we could amend the nomination. I suggested maybe we leave that out for now because it didn't seem to be yeah, it, right. it, it was pretty sketchy. Mm -hmm. And also, too, when we first read the consultant's draft, he was sort of contradicting himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right. we really yeah. needed to exactly the point remove that portion. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't need it. No. It's, it stands alone without it, but it just seemed very interesting. Mm -hmm. Question. Any other questions or comments? That uh, seminary is associated with, with the Dulles family. Uh, I believe that the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles' grandfather, was must have been a fellow faculty member. I, I kind of thought he was the president. Maybe he came after. Uh, yeah, it was um, after Dr. Huntington's death that they, really, actually after um, Huntington retired that they officially um, made the office of president. Mm -hmm. He came down from Watertown, I think. <clears throat> Yeah, well, that's where they had yeah. a summer yeah. place up there, uh, Secretary Lansing and the Douglas. Do I hear a motion to approve this nomination? So Who said that? Carol? Okay. <laughs> second. That's second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Those of you who have not been to see the extraordinary uh, the chapel, the Bullard Chapel, uh, now National Landmarks, uh, has been said. Uh, ought to get out to Auburn to see it. There are a lot of other things to see in Auburn, exciting things, but uh, that is a jewel box, a Tiffany jewel box, and I hope that the community can keep it in <coughs> order and promote it. And then, just as a, a sidebar footnote, to this. Um, the house was purchased, uh, the current owners were co-owners for a long time with Mike Long and his, his wife. Um, and then they bought out the Longs. And Mike Long was one of the people who was instrumental in saving the Willer Chapel, actually putting up his own house uh, as collateral for you know, getting the, the project going. And a few years ago, we actually nominated uh, Mike Long's house. It was the uh, uh, it, it's got a long name, uh, the White House, uh, but a, a, another nice little property in Auburn. So it, there seems to be a lot of connection with Mike Long. <laughs> Mike Long was the um, city manager of Auburn uh, for, for many years, and I cannot remember any city official who was more supportive, <coughs> more responsive uh, than, than Mike to. Well, he just put a deed to his own house to save a, a substantially yeah. significant property. Yeah. Well, we'll move on to 
The next one. You mean right. the Mitsui factory? It, yes. Okay. We'll enjoy getting this on things. So yeah, it's very festive. Um, I think the pronunciation is Marosul. Um, when I was an undergrad, I had a history professor whose last name was spelled the same way. He pronounced it Sule, but he was from New Orleans. <laughs> so I'm going to say Sule. Uh, and this is my final presentation. The Marisol Non Such Mincemeat Factory in Syracuse in Onondaga County. The factory was constructed between 1904 and 1957, with the majority given over to, two, to manufacturing two products, that is, mincemeat and powdered milk. And a portion was given over to research and development. Uh, the building is being nominated for its um, significance with um, their criteria A for uh, industry and also for architecture. Um, it displays two types of uh, early 20th century industrial construction, and I'll get into that a little later. It's an odd building because it kept growing and adding, so I think the easiest way is for me to use this aerial view to help explain it. I have to take my notes with me because pointers not working, otherwise I'd be using that. All right. Here we have the 1904 factory that they built. Here's the 1904 warehouse. This part here is what they call the connector, which was also built around 1904. Um, um, let's see. This is the cold storage building here, which was built in 1913. Over here is the machine shop from 19, I believe, 1919. And then this area here was added in 1957 and for the research and development. And the machine shop was then incorporated into the 1957 redo. So uh, it, it might, I don't know how, if it was confusing in the nomination of the consultant has this, she loves to kind of like do A, B, C, D, E, B. To me, it gets a little confusing, so I, I hope I was able to clear that up a little bit in the editing. Merrill School was founded in 1868 by G. Lewis Merrill and Oscar School of Syracuse as a canning factory, first canning corn and other local produce. They introduced non such mincemeat in 1885 and later Clem, which is milk spelled in reverse, <laughs> um, which is powdered milk. Both product, products are still being produced, uh, but unfortunately not in Syracuse. Uh, Marisul were manufacturing the mincemeat at another facility, and after phenomenal nationwide success, they needed to build a new larger factory. So they bought property on Syracuse's, uh, well, in its industrial quadrant, which is the northwest side of the city, um, and North Franklin Street, if you know that area. Okay. You keep reading about the solar flats and how they turn that area into an industrial quadrant. Yeah, that's the same place. The building is significant under Criterion C for its architecture, like I said, representing two types of early 20th century factory construction, and for being a design of local engineer Irving S. Merrill. Um, unfortunately, very little is known about Irving Merrill, other than he was the son of the uh, company founder, G. Lewis Merrill. The young of Merrill used common mill construction in the 1904 factory and warehouse. The infill and glass block in the warehouse, which is in the lower uh, image, um, are part of the 1957 renovations when Borden, the owner at that time, added the research and development department. So they were putting in a lot of these smaller windows, putting in the glass block, and doing a lot of infill. Um, the lower left shows the new facade, the 1919 machine shop that became part of the research and development operations for the company. On the lower right, uh, shows the west elevation of the machine shop with its arcading and glass block windows and brick infill. So you have a more historic view on the west side than on the south side. And the south side is the facade. 
The interior shows more of the two types of early 20th century industrial construction. And the top image is an interior view of the cold storage building, which is a poured in place concrete building with mushroom column supports. The lower image is the 1904 warehouse, exhibiting the common mill construction previously mentioned. The building meets registration requirements for both types of construction as outlined in the 2010 MPDF Industrial Resources in the City of Syracuse, Lombardown County. Part of the building has been renovated, um, but still retains much of its historic form and fabric. Plans are underway to renovate other portions of the building, and it received its Part 1 approval for the federal commercial tax credit. We're still waiting for Part 2 to arrive. Syracuse is also a certified local government, and we have a letter of support from the city. Questions or comments about the mincemeat factory? There's no questions. I'll ask for a motion to approve. I'll move. Okay. Second. Jennifer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, now under the Forsyth Warrant Farm Warrant Court. This is this is a very interesting one. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <clears throat> All right. So the Forsyth Warren Farm, located in the hamlet of Warren's Corners, Niagara County, is significant under Criterion A in the area of exploration settlement for its direct association with the earliest period of permanent Euro-American settlement in western New York State, which occurred in the first years of the 19th century, and for its association with the Holland Land Company. The Forsyth Warren Farm is also significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture as a largely intact collection of resources that reflect over a century of use and growth. Resources from the early 19th century are relatively rare in western New York given the region's role as a key theater during the War of 1812 which led to the complete devastation of major early settlements in Buffalo and Lewiston. Few buildings dating from this earliest period of pioneer settlement in western New York survive. The period of significance begins with the early development of the property, the construction of the circa 1808 tavern and barn, and continues until circa 1950 with the sale of the property. This, this period encompasses the entire story of the Forsyth and Warren families in association with the former tavern and farm, reflecting its origins and transitions into a modern family farm. The significance of the property is enhanced by its rarity and the substantial documentation of its history, as well as its strong connection to the Niagara Frontier Theater of the War of 1812. The farm encompasses approximately five acres of land on the south side of Ridge Road at the west side of Cambria Lockport Town Line Road. The Forsyth Warren Farm consists of six contributing buildings and one contributing site, including the tavern residence, a large barn, a corn crib, a large garage, a chicken coop, a machine shed, and a family burial ground with stones and burials dating as early as 1812. The boundary was drawn to include all of the remaining land and all of the surviving historic features associated with the, his the historic farm. Although only a small portion of the original 190 acres survives intact, the property retains a full complement of resources that illustrate its pioneer agricultural history. These are set on an open parcel that generally retains its agricultural setting and feeling. The earliest portion of the 1808 former tavern and farmhouse, along with the first section of the present farm, are among the earliest surviving historic resources in the re region, and they are directly associated with the Holland Land Company's efforts to settle Niagara County at the dawn of the 19th century. Owned by the same family for over a century, the property conveys a complete picture of its history, from its origins as a pioneer-era tavern to its later use as a private home and farm, and its private cemetery holds the burials of many early family members. As a private home and farm, uh, I'm sorry, as an inn and tavern, the property played a key role in providing support to newly arriving settlers in the area. In November of 1804, John Forsyth purchased the property from the Holland Land Company, relocating his family from Genesee County westward to the unsettled frontier of Niagara County, where he established an inn around 1808. After his untimely death in 1812, his widow, Mary Ganson Forsyth, took over operation of the tavern, where she bravely served the troops in the area and aided those who fled eastward uh, throughout the Niagara frontier. One of those troops, Ezra Warren, shown in the photo here, uh, returned after the conflict and married Mary Forsyth, and the two continued to own and operate the tavern with their growing family. 
1825, after a spiritual awakening, Ezra Warren closed the tavern, converting it for use as a family residence and farm. Ezra Warren became a prominent figure in the local community, opening a grocery store and aiding in the founding of the local church and school. It is from him that the hamlet of Warren's Corners took its name. After Ezra's death in 1879, Ezra and Mary's son, Henry Harrison Warren, took over operation of the farm. It continued under Warren family ownership until around 1950 when it was sold out of the family after nearly 150 years of continuous ownership. So just to give you a sense, if you're not accustomed to reading historic maps of Western New York, this area here is the city of Buffalo. Niagara Falls is right in here. Fort Niagara is up here. So they were literally just a stone's throw. And this was literally the only road in, the, in this area. So if they were fleeing eastward, they were coming down that road. Just a stone's throw, but far enough away from the action to survive. It, it yeah. came almost to their doorstep. So they were very fortunate. So it appears the house itself was constructed in two different eras, which is discussed in depth in the nomination. The first, New World Dutch portion, portion does, appears to date to circa 1808, while the later portions may date to what is vaguely described as a rounding out of the house by Ezra Warren in the 1820s. The building definitely is a candidate for further physical investigation and possibly even dendrochronology. chronology. So uh, my colleague Bill was a big help to me here, <laughs> looking at early architecture from this era. Um, he took a look at these photos and noticed right away that it was an example of New World Dutch building traditions with an H-bent frame and the brick nogging. And this is the first, but likely not only, uh, known example of this building technique found in Western New York and is indic indicative of the carrying of knowledge and building traditions from Eastern uh, New York State and Eastern regions through into this Western New York region. from the attic there. So shown here is the barn and its pasture. Uh, you can see the corn crib, the garage, um, the chicken coop. And here's the family cemetery, which is south of the main house and barn. Um, it's set sort of up on a rise on the property. And at the left here is John Forsyth. Uh, the center is Mary Forsyth Warren. And at the right is Ezra Warren. So while we do have an attendance, the building's owner, Tyler Booth, um, Tyler was a big help in finding all the history and pulling that all together for us. Tyler, I don't know if you want to come up and say a few words about what you've been doing at the property or... <laughs> Changed since um, these photos. Um, every day we're getting more and more resources added. A lot of things that were taken from the property have returned. A lot of buildings off the property are actually surrounding us. They've moved to other properties. So we're working on uh, recompiling the property back to mm -hmm. as well as. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Is it true that it is impossible to pound a nail into the wall and find me? Not impossible. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a few people not believe you that it was brick and walnuts. Yes, they it certainly attempted was. it and realized that they. We, we did an archaeological survey in this vicinity years ago and uh, talked to the owner at the time. And that's the thing he, can, he said you can't even count it down with the black walnut that, that this house is being. That's why it's standing. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it, it's like concrete itself. And uh, Bill, do you want to talk about what you found out about Ontario? Hey. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, you know, I. You, you blame me, now I blame you, because I got sucked into this whole thing. I wound up buying a book on early building traditions in Ontario, and I, I'd known there were two Dutch barns out, outside of Toronto somewhere in an open-air museum, but in looking at that book, there were clearly Dutch-framed buildings in York in early Toronto, so these traditions were moving up mm -hmm. across the border into Ontario, which is pretty remarkable. Doug has to take down every wall now. Yeah. I'm sure there's more of this out there. 
Could, could we go back to the photograph uh, of uh, the old veteran, uh, Warren, and the map uh, associated with it? Is that hand-drawn map part of their property? Is that something you have? Yeah, we have a lot of records that um, the neighboring house was built by the same family, and most of the stuff is in the house that sold the movie over there, so they had it fully back. Just look at that face. Uh, he, lived to, he lived to be 90. Uh, you know, he was right in the thick of the action. And the description in this other nation of the violence of the war in the, in the Niagara frontier it was really uh, gripping. I mean, I, I yeah. guess I had read some of that before, but I, it's never been so concisely presented. And it's wonderful that it's associated with a surviving house and somehow that man's face uh, sort of sums it all up. <laughs> Total abstainer on the shoulder. <laughs> but, but it's, a, uh, I think, a commendable uh, nomination. And, uh, and what the present owner has proposed to do with it is even more commendable. Great. We, should, Great. we should have a picture of the wife. I know. I know. Yeah, exactly. There's something else, too. That's so. right. She was out repenting me after all those years of running that tavern. So he probably kept it to her quietly. Other questions or comments? Do I hear a motion? Motion. Tom Mag, second. Kristen? Kristen here. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. That's great. Uh, on to Empire Worsted Mill in Jamestown. Great. Back to my bread and butter of schools and factories. <laughs> so the Empire Worsted Mills at 31 Water Street in Jamestown, Chautauqua County is significant as a largely intact, locally significant example of a worsted mill erected in phases between 1896 and 1910. The Empire Worsted Mills Company is, is locally significant under criteria A in industry as it was the third largest worsted milling firm in Jamestown during the late 19th and early 20th century. The Empire Worsted Mill Company is also locally significant under the Criterion C in architecture as a good representative example of mill construction, a building type commonly used by companies in, engaged in textile milling. The Empire Worsted Mill's period of significance is from 1896 to 1955. The period of significance begins in 1896 with the construction of the earliest extant building and ends in 1955 when the company closed and vacated the mill. The area also, this era also can, can corresponds to the height of work of worsted milling in Jamestown when thousands of people worked in approximately half a dozen mills in the city. So the company incorporated in 1896 and specialized in turning untreated wool into finished articles of men's suit wear. The Empire Worsted Mills Company employed hundreds of people, many of whom were English immigrants, and remained active until 1955 when financial issues related to tariffs and competitions from non-unionized southern mills forced it to shut down. The mill is also significant for its relationship to the history of Jamestown's worsted industry. Industrialized worsted milling started in Jamestown in 1873, and by 1900, mills were the city's second largest employer. When the Empire Worsted Mills Company closed in 1955, it was the last major worsted mill in Jamestown, and the company's bankruptcy marked the end of a period of industrial growth and vitality that defined Jamestown for close to a century. So it's an extremely difficult building to photograph in one <laughs> overall shot. But built and added to over time, the Empire Worsted Mills is a sprawling brick mill facility. It consists of an east-west oriented E-shaped building with its long side along Water Street, three large north-south wings extending north toward the river behind, and a smaller wing projecting to the northwest from the western elevation of the westernmost north-south wing. You can follow all that. <laughs> There's plenty of maps in the nomination. Originally, a narrow east-west street ran between the current E-shaped building and the three wings, uh, but the, as the facility expanded and constructed additional manufacturing space on both sides of the street, it eventually roofed over and incorporated the street into the internal general circulation in order to connect all of the buildings. But you, when you're in that sort of space, you still sort of feel like you're outside the building even though it's enclosed. So mill construction first appeared in New England, and by the late 19th century, the construction methods were used to erect these mills, 
were widely disseminated through trade journals. The mill construction techniques with de which developed during the mid-19th century were commonly referred to as standard mill construction method and minimized the effects of vibrating machinery and maximized fire protection, both critical concerns for milling companies. To maintain structural stability and retard the spread of fires, heavy timber internal support structures were used, stairwells were isolated, and production spaces were separated by fireproof doors. These defining elements are still present and legible in the Empire Worsted Mills, as are other critical features such as the mill's long banks of windows which lit the interior workspaces. The mill also contains important secondary spaces such as the dye house, as well as highly intact executive offices. The architecture of these spaces reflects their specific usage by the company. The executive offices contain highly finished details such as tin ceiling, wainscoting, and an extent, um, and an extent wall. The dye house features regularly spaced ground level, uh, ground level openings and banks of elevated windows which created airflow and allowed the company to vent steam and water vapor, a prevailing concern for mill engineers and factory owners. So this is the Empire Warstead Mills. Are there any questions on this? I think that does a masterful job describing the kind of complex process of the worst of world production and the fact that they manufactured uniforms for the Union Army during the Civil War in, in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you learn something new with all of these projects. Now we all know about worsting. And <laughs> <laughs> Do I hear a motion to accept this nomination? So, is that Carol? Yeah, Carol. Carol? Yes. Second? Wait, wait for a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. On to Buffalo Public School 78. Like I said, continuing our study of public schools in Buffalo. Yes. Do we have them all yet? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> Buffalo Public School number 78 is locally significant as a representation of a standardized school in the Kensington Bailey neighborhood of Buffalo. Located at 345 Olympic Avenue, the former elementary school was constructed in 1927-28. So between 1920 and 1930, the population of the Kensington Bailey neighborhood significantly grew from around 18,000 people in 1920 to almost 50,000 in 1930. The growth of the neighborhood quickly overwhelmed the limited educational spaces uh, within the vicinity, which consisted of public school number 23, which is not extant, and three wooden frame dwellings used as annexes on Alma Avenue. In 1926, the Bailey East Delvin Citizens Association, a group of businessmen that advocated for improvements to the Kensington Bailey neighborhood, successfully appealed to the city of Buffalo for the construction of a new school building, PS 78, to serve children living in the area. Between 1919 and 1929, PS 78 was one of 24 new schools and 26 additions built by the Buffalo School District. This rapid school construction reflected post-World War I school building patterns as well as the efforts of the Buffalo School District to end the use of unsanitary and unsafe wooden annexes for educating the city's children. The building was designed by Ernest Crimmy, head of the Buffalo School District's Bureau of, Bureau of School Architecture, and is significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture for embodying the features of standardized school design at the start of the 20th century, when New York State and federal guidelines regarding educational architecture began influencing school construction across the state. While many guidelines related to school design were promulgated in the late 19th century, it was not until 1904 that laws related to the law, layout, interior spaces, and circulation patterns in schools were passed. These laws resulted in more uniform school designs across New York State, and PS 78 reflects many of these prevailing guidelines of the era. era. In addition to safety features like decentralized staircases, Grimmie's design for PS 78 included a large auditorium, gymnasium, cafeteria, science rooms, and shop rooms, all of which were standardized spaces required by law in New York State educational facilities. The period of significance for Buffalo Public School number 78 is 1927 to 28, the school's original date of construction and its opening. The building reflects national trends of school design in the 1920s and retains nearly all of its original features related to these standards. So this is Buffalo Public School number 78. Are there any questions on this one? Were they numbered sequentially as they were built? I think so. Yeah. Or at least planned, yeah. maybe not actual construction starting. Mm -hmm. Other what questions? Is, what is it being used for now? Uh, this is a tax credit project, so it will be rehabilitated 
I'm not sure exactly the specific use of it, but it is a vacant school. Apartments. It's being renovated for apartments using tax credits. It's being renovated for apartments using tax credits. Those photographs, where were they taken? Um, they were probably taken maybe a year or so ago. Yeah, that seems to be yeah. extraordinary. It, 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 it's not bad. I, yeah. it's, it's worse. Bad, bad. <laughs> it's worse. Depends on how long it was sitting vacant, to too. Yeah. That's quite it's good. good. And at the auditorium, I mean, that's a really fine shape. The lighting, amazing. Do we hear a motion to approve this nomination? Motion. Tom Hanks, second. Seems to be here. All in favor? Aye. Opposed to abstain? Motion carries. Great, thank you very much. On to Broadway Historic District uh, in Montgomery. Marcello, you have to practice to say it wrong. <laughs> and Janet, pronounce John's now. John's. Uh, oh, what do we need to press the arrows? Yeah. yeah. All right, so I'm very pleased to present this district because it originated uh, really many years ago, maybe 15 years ago, with a DOT project. And I would like to thank the Preservation League, especially Fran and this group of funding it, and the Village of Monticello, and especially the Sullivan County Planning Department for being such awesome sponsors. Their public outreach was so outstanding and comprehensive that by the time I arrived for the official public meeting, only one property owner showed up. And he came because he wanted more information about the commercial tax credit, and so he had our undivided attention. Uh, so Monticello is located in the southern foothills of the Catskills, and although we think of it now as a commercial, as a center of commerce and entertainment during the Warsh Belt era, and a struggling town ever since, it has a long history going back to the uh, settlement period, and it also has a history of being rebuilt and remade multiple times. Um, the district is significant for its important associations with the long history of development of Sullivan County, and as the commercial center of the county during the resort era. It is also significant for its collection of buildings illustrating popular types and styles from this period that represent the village's important role in local history. So this is essentially a dense four block long commercial district and we begin here at the eastern end of it um, and that's Curley's Hotel. And although there's one more building, the Village Hall, which is behind the taillights of that car, um, we begin here because it is the intersection of two important regional routes Old Route 17, which travels east-west east along Broadway through the county, and Route 42, which is north-south um, on Pleasant Street, um, again, following that uh, car. Um, and you may be asking yourself right about now, why ever is Broadway so very, very wide? And well, that's because Broadway, and why didn't she crop the slide, as my colleagues were saying? Um, well, that's because Broadway follows one of the earliest and most important transportation corridors through Sullivan County, the 1809 Newburgh Koshekton Turnpike, which connected the Hudson and Delaware Rivers and opened the entire county up to settlement. The turnpike and the village were laid out and planned by the Jones brothers, the road to be this wide. And Broadway is wide because it was planned to be an important street, just as Monticello, with its lofty name, was, uh, although they probably never heard it pronounced, uh, was conceived of as the county seat and intended to become the government, legal, and religious and commercial center of the county. And this is the 1844 courthouse on the right, and on the left, the third and current courthouse from 1809. Uh, the village fulfilled these goals when a series of at least three to four large fires destroyed huge parts of it um, over the course of the 19th century and required its continual renewal. Well, um, after World War II, the general decline of the Jewish agricultural and resort industries, um, after, generally after World War II, pr proved a substantial handicap to Monticello's economic security, and indeed this accounts for some holes in the streetscape. But as we walk up Broadway, we need to remember that Monticello is old, um, but that most of its buildings are 20th century, like this 1910 bank on a site that has long been occupied by a bank, 
and that most of its buildings replaced earlier buildings. We should also note that unlike anywhere else in Sullivan County, Monticello is urban. You simply do not find a streetscape of two and three story attached buildings like this anywhere else in the county. And this is um, going up Broadway near Landfield Street. I don't know if you have your maps here, but we're just gonna go up the north side of Broadway here. Um, and this, again, further to the west, this is Landfield, um, this is west of Landfield Avenue, 444 to 456 Broadway. Um, and here, I've paired contemporary view with one from the 50s or 60s. So the building on the right can be seen in that um, streetscape, and I guess without a pointer, I'll have to point it. It's right here. Okay. And again, these are going to be the farthest buildings. Oh, oops, I went by accident. Okay, so these are the farthest buildings in that historic view. And then beneath it is a close up of Woolworths. Um, which is the last building, almost the last building in the streetscape. And then here, and next, the building next to Woolworths was an important meat store, it's attached to it. Um, and then here, that's Woolworths again, you can see that little store, and looking back up, and many of the same buildings are still in the streetscape today. And then the south side of Broadway, the streetscape didn't fare as well, and is not as solid, going back up to the east end, uh, you also have larger buildings, institutional and civic buildings, and some residents. And this is all the way back up to the east end across from where we started at Curley's. This is the older um, library in the village. It's a WPA style building, and it was, it's from 1936, but it wasn't actually built with WPA funds. Um, and then this is the 1960 Sullivan County Trust building. Um, Two, two 1910 residents that survived at 433 and 435 Broadway. And this is the earliest building in the district, the 1844 Methodist Church that was um, altered in 1892 and its later 1872 parsonage. And this is the newest building in the, built in the district. It's a brutalist bank from 1970 and we're celebrating the fact that 1970 becomes 50 years old in a few weeks. <laughs> And then this is the current, <laughs> the current library, which is a, um, um, a 1925 building at 450, 479 Broadway. And then the district also goes up a few of the side streets, up and down a few of the side streets, where the buildings are closely related in age and context. And this is um, Landfield Street. That's a little row of uh, buildings and uh, the village garage, I believe that is. And these two are on John's, oh wait, sorry. This is on Liberty Street. This is the 1955 Veterans Memorial Hall. This is our tax credit project. Believe it or not, the applicant is prepared to um, invest $500,000 um, to put a commercial daycare center in here. And this is on John Street. Um, this is a, um, let's see, that's um, a 1935 school and that's a 1926 um, telephone company building, I believe. And then this is a selection of some of the, build, of the village's uh, religious buildings. It has quite a few. These two are on John Street. That's a Henry Dudley Church that was already listed. Um, I believe that's 1880. And this one, which is one of my favorites. Uh, it began life as a Catholic church in 1864. Then it was a warehouse before being uh, redesigned as a synagogue in 1925, and it's now Baptist Church. Wow. That's a very con common kind of uh, synagogue, kind of a Baroque influenced synagogue design in Sullivan County. Meanwhile, this building, the one on the left, was built as a synagogue in 1912, and then the congregation moved up and redesigned the old Catholic Church as the building you just saw, and then they moved back down the hill and redesigned their original building in the modern style in 1962. And that's what you see in, my, in Sullivan County and in Monticello, a lot, of, a lot of reuse and redesign. And then lastly, on the far western end of the district, uh, we end with the Civil War uh, Memorial in a small park that anchors the western end of the district. And I have two letters. Um, sadly, the, the uh, owner who is supporting it is out of the district, several blocks out of the district, but he, it's a travel-in, um, 
1960s building and they're begging to be included, uh, but there are several blocks to the west and I, I don't know, I guess we can look at them for individual support, but I don't think they can be included. And then the owners of the Chase Bank that you saw in the 1960s building, um, there are four of them and they've objected, but otherwise we have very good support locally. Um, our, our, our county and, and village uh, people did an excellent job. We're hoping for more tax credit projects, which is a community that desperately needs them. Any questions about Monticello, other than pronunciation? No. <laughs> Why is the bank protesting? Um, they don't say. Oh. We, the joint owners of 411 Broadway, object to listing this property. It's a shame when a sophisticated commercial entity like Chase Bank does not understand the yeah. in our yeah. program, but like I've got the program enough to give a damn about this. Yeah. Other questions or comments? It was noteworthy that there was no record of brick making in the area or the presence of yellow clay that was right. found. There was a lot of yellow buildings. Yeah, so what did you think about that? I I mean, I don't know. Um, yeah. you know, again, Neil Larson wrote this, he did a very thorough job. Yes, I, I agree. And uh, a little mystery. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, um, you know, I heard Neil give the presentation when we gave it to the sole property owner there. And I was kind of struck by the fact that he talked about the urban character of this, which I actually hadn't thought of before, and I saw him stealing that. Um, because you just don't see. Sullivan County is really an acquired taste, and I, I acquired it. Um, and you just don't see this sort of thing anywhere else. And also the, the very wide, um, Broadway, which does go back to the Jones brothers, and every you know, as it burned a couple times, they had a fight to keep the county seat there, and they, they did. It's like that in Newburgh, too. Yes, Newburgh, yeah, the same thing. Have we ever uh, uh, put uh, nominated in the register any of the big uh, Jewish resort hotels like Kutcher's, which is right near Monticello? No, um, we tried hard. Where's is James here? James tried hard to, um, what was it? The um, Grossinger's. Which Grossinger's. one? Grossinger's. 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 James tried very hard to create an argument for saying that um, Grossinger's was eligible or a piece of it was eligible, but they've changed. So much. First of all, they changed over the years, sure. and then a lot of them have fallen down, and we haven't found something intact enough. They certainly were significant. We tried to nominate uh, Browns, and again, that had changed so far so much, and then it burned, and basically all we had left was the Browns bungalow where the Mr. and Mrs. Brown lived. Um, they wanted to nominate the Jerry Lewis Theater, but it wasn't the theater Jerry Lewis had played in. It. it was a replacement of that theater. So you have this continual pattern of change, fires, and then um, deterioration, yeah. and then more <coughs> fires, and you just don't have one that's intact enough. And it's very sad. And you drive across there, and you see empty, empty hotel, empty bungalow colony, yeah. one after another. Yeah, a significant piece of history that is and this is, is only is the third this will only be the third um, district in Sullivan County we have Liberty um, um, I forget the last one we did and um, this Calhoun and this and it will be only the third tax credit project if it goes through is Port Chervis in uh, Sullivan no, no, I'm sorry it's orange, orange. It's orange. Any other questions or comments? Uh, quick response to Carol's question about yellow brick. The yellow brick clay usually comes from New Jersey, and this is Senate, right across yeah. the border, so uh, it's probably New Jersey brick. Got it. Thanks, Mike. Oh, we do have Woodstock. <laughs> yes. Do I hear a motion? Wint, second. Second. Erica, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed to abstaining? Motion carries. On to North Guilford. Okay, so this is, this couldn't be more different, more remote. This is the small North Guilford Cemetery located in a very rural part of Shenango County, four miles north of Guilford Center, which is itself a very rural hamlet. Um, the tiny crossroads hamlet is centered around the intersection of Walberg Road and County Route 36. 
um, which is the north-south road to the left there. And that's a main road between Guildford and Norwich. And um, this hamlet was known locally as Old Four Corners, and the next one to the north was Little Four Corners. Um, and this nomination um, came to us directly from a compliance project. Um, and the sponsor is someone who actually has family buried here, and she just wasn't satisfied with that determination of eligibility. She did not feel it would be protected unless it was listed, and she wrote the nomination. She did a good job on it. So the site... I'm all the way from Poughkeepsie. I know her. You do? Yeah, yeah. I was but surprised she, to see her name. Yeah, she... Um, I don't really know how did she even knew what was going on, but she knew about the... Was it a wind farm? Wind project. <laughs> it was a wind project. Yeah. And she just got on our case about it, and we said, okay, well, you write it, and she did. So um, the site is a one-acre rectangular lot, gently sloping hillside, bordered by trees and open meadows. And its elevated site provides long views of the surrounding pastoral landscape. There is one central path through it, um, which you can't see in the snow, um, that ends in an oval loop before circling back to the entrance. And coniferous trees are planted around the border. Otherwise, the cemetery contains almost 300 burials. Um, not all of them have markers, which are arranged in eight parallel rows facing east. About 43% of the interments occurred before 1900. The first recorded one was 1812, although some of them were probably earlier. And the last descendant of the Selman families was buried in 1943. The cemetery was established when a committee purchased this lot in 1807 and significant in settlement, in the area of settlement, because it contains the graves of most of North Guilford's pioneer families and their descendants, and most of them came from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut and it provides important information about the original growth and development of the hamlet of North Guilford and the surrounding area. It's also significant in the area of art because it contains 12 early 19th century grave markers carved by members of the Crandall School. And the Crandall School is a well-known group of regional carvers um, that refers to the sons of master carver Joseph L. Crandall, a Vermont neighbor who um, settled in Shenango County, and he's sometimes called Fern Man. He has stones throughout Shenango County. However, um, these particular commissions may have resulted from the connection between Joseph Crandall and North Guilford settle, settler Joseph Rhodes. His son is seen there. He was a Revolutionary War vet, and he was Crandall's cousin. And you can note the distinctive Fern design on here, even though this is the, not Crandall himself, but um, one of his sons. Randall Sr.'s stones are characterized by complex, rounded forms and draped stones, willows, other motifs. However, his work is especially noted by the way he fills up nearly all of the space with geometric and foliate forms, pinwheels, stylized flowers, philodendron leaves, and stippling. And by contrast, the sons use similar motifs, but paid less attention to symmetry and detail and relied more on bold, simplified, overscaled forms that appear to have been drawn more spontaneously. And these two kind of illustrate that freestyle event. This is a husband and wife. Um, though unsigned, these really show a certain freedom and artistic individuality, um, especially through the, the choice and placement of accents. Um, a good example is a stone of Nathan, Nathan, Nelson Mowry. And note the oversized fern border and the bed of stippling. Some of these are faded and hard to see, but um, these are two especially fine examples. Um, Sally Whitcomb on the right with the abstract sun rays and the pinwheels mixed with ferns. And on Jacob Hout, the oversized acanthus sleeves and the fern border. I really like both of these very much. Um, the North Guilford Cemetery also contains the graves of veterans from all the major wars and retains a high level of integrity. Any questions about the North Guilford Cemetery? Can we hear a motion from the North Guilford Cemetery? Cemetery. So moved. Jay? I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Thank you. Did I think there? Thank you. 
Harlem. I am really excited that I got to work on this nomination. Thank you, Jenny, for being out on maternity leave. <laughs> <laughs> the group didn't want to wait until she returned, so they only had to twist my arm a little bit. Um, it is significant under criterion. Um, uh, it's, it's not an LGBT project, but it's the same group. Um, so they wanted to just want to work with me on it, so well, without waiting. So it's significant other criterion, A, for its important associations with the social and political history of Harlem and the nation, uh, most notably for its associations with the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. So most of us uh, probably know something about the 1963 March on Washington. On August 28, 1963, more than a quarter million people, mostly African Americans, marched from the Washington Monument to Lincoln Memorial, seeking economic equality and equal access to public accommodations, housing, education, and jobs. It was the largest civil rights demonstration held to date. It was led by a coalition of major civil rights organizations, labor and religious leaders, including some of the most famous names of the era. And despite fears of violence, the march was entirely peaceful. And it culminated in Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, his most famous and inspirational address. The march is credited with spurring passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and with inspiring millions of citizens um, across the country. So while I, what I was totally ignorant of was that almost every detail of that march was organized and, pl and planned in this building in Harlem, mostly under the direction of Bayard Rustin, a gay pacifist, civil rights activist, and organizational genius who personally worked out ne nearly every one of the complicated details that made the march a success. And some of you will remember that we listed Baird Rustin's um, apartment in Penn South a few years ago. But rare, uh, so also this proves that everything comes back to New York, <laughs> um, which again, I was very happy to find out. Rustin labored in this house for months planning the route of the march, training marshals and techniques of crowd control using nonviolent methods, arranging for the sound system, editing and approving the signs, coordinating a large staff of activists and organizers to publicize the event and recruit marchers, organizing churches to raise money, chartering buses and trains, and planning transportation for marchers, planning first aid sections, calculating the number of porta potties needed, figuring out how many lunches were needed and arranging for volunteers to make and sell them, and determining the logistics of providing water fountains and water storage trucks. You may think those are small things, but put together, all of those things were crucial to making the march a success. But despite his essential role and the fact that he was among the earliest proponents of the march, he basically suggested it along with A. Philip Randolph, and despite the fact that A. Philip Randolph had proposed that Rustin serve as its executive director, African American leaders refused to appoint him to the position or to acknowledge him publicly because he was openly gay. Instead, he worked long hours behind the scenes, mostly in this house, as Randolph's deputy. And even though the building was used for only a few months before and after the march, the work that took place here is critically linked to the history and significance of the event. So looking at the house itself, um, it was built in 1884 as a single family residence in the Queen Anne style, and there's a whole row of them on the block. They're kind of virtually identical to the one you see on the left here. Um, however, it was redesigned in 1928 by Bertner Tandy, the first African American architect registered in New York State. And the redesign took a form popular in New York City. Um, you've probably seen a lot of them, I think there's whole districts of them. I think Sutton Place is one. Um, it involved stripping off all the exterior decoration and applying a uniform stucco finish in a style that was actually called English Cottage style, relocating the main entrance to the ground floor. Other changes include adding the small metal balconies, and there's a sloping parapet that you can't really see at the roof line. And although there are many um, examples of the general type, in Manhattan, this is the only known example in Harlem, and it's the only example by Tandy. We don't know exactly why he was hired, but in 1928, the building had been repurposed for institutional use. That may have been the reason to make it um, more efficient for that use. I, I don't really know why. There's no information on it. It served as a home for girls, a shelter for young pregnant women, and as the Utopia Children's House, 
a healthcare, daycare, and social service organization. And we're also claiming uh, significance in social history for those associations as well. It remained in some kind of social service use until the March on Washington people uh, rented it, and then it returned to social service use until 1978. Today it's owned by the city of New York and it is used as apartments. Um, in each of these uses, it generally retained its divi division into two rooms on each floor. Tandy removed a few partitions and made it more suitable to in for in institutional use, but it remains fairly intact to the um, 1928 design, which is how it looked in 1963. Now, I do have floor plans from 1928, but they're really extremely hard to see. I'm just showing you to show you that I have them, and that this is still the same general floor plan, the two rooms on each floor. This is the basement, and this is the, um, the first, the parlor floor. Um, and then, this is, it's difficult to get interior photos because it's in um, their apartments, but this is the um, ground floor stair. We know Tandy installed this. We know the manufacturer, uh, Brooklyn Firm. And then here to the left is a, in the basement, that's an original fireplace. So we know that was here when it was used um, by the marchers. And then this is on, I believe, the second floor. And again, there's not much left. It's just the open two-room plan, and it's very crowded with furniture, so it's hard to see anything. Uh, but what's more important is the activity that took place here and the fact that it still retains the open plan. So I don't, this is 63. I'm not sure who's standing in the window. Uh, but the exterior, exterior is still nearly identical to the way you see it. The only changes were a new door and new windows in the same configuration. The interior is recognizable in plan and re retains a few features, though crowded with furniture. This is an important and exciting nomination that connects New York with a nationally significant event. Um, we do have a letter of support from the Commissioner of New York City, HPD, a very enthusiastic letter of support, which is a city agency that owns the building. and. Um, they are essentially scheduled to be transferred for rehabilitation and management as affordable housing, and the new owner has expressed its support for the listing as well. So any questions about this um, listing, the nomination, I should say? It's clearly nationally significant. Yes, and the nomination was really very well written and, and thorough. It's very impressive. It was written by uh, Christina of Andrews and, and Andrew. Right. And it's nice that they are busted and it's recognized again in the second nomination. Yeah, they, yeah. they had suggested we do it under B for him, but we can't do two things under B. It's the same period. But the story is Yes, the story is there. That's great. I love everything I learned about Bayard Rustin. Yeah, definitely zero. What's the level of significance? National. Exactly. Yeah, because it's a national event. Motion. Second. That's fine. That's fine. Motion. All in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Any opposed to abstain? Okay. Okay, now, uh, Jay, you weren't here when we started, so we pushed board business back to now. Okay. Operating on the assumption that you might have something to say about the canal issue. Okay. Uh, also, would you introduce yourselves? Uh, since you arrived uh, after the audit resources. Sure. I'm Jay DeLorenzo. I'm the president of the Preservation League of New York State. Okay. And uh, I, I can speak briefly about this. I can speak as um, as someone who represents an organization that is outside of the reimagined canal process. So what we're talking about here is um, a, a state process um, called Reimagine the Canal to do, to do just that, to look at the canal system in New York State and to reimagine it for the next hundred years. Uh, and uh, part of the uh, challenge that we've had as a statewide preservation organization is that the task force that was assembled to do this reimagine process did not include the Preservation League, nor did it include any historic preservation organizations from across the state. So immediately our 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 ears went up because we were concerned about the voice for historic preservation on that task force. Now, 
Um, State Parks does have a seat, as does the Erie Canal and National Heritage Corridor, and they are very um, uh, pro-preservation and in favor of, of protecting this National Historic Landmark. Uh, however, they have a lot of other issues that they're concerned with. So um, we have been on the outside trying to figure out what's going on on the inside and eagerly awaiting the task force's report. My understanding is that the task force will put together some kind of a report, whether it will be for public consumption or not, we don't know. They're having a final meeting, we believe, this week, tomorrow, tomorrow in, uh, Syracuse. Um, in Syracuse, which will be the culmination of kind of three regional processes that did include public comment period uh, for each of those, but they were very narrowly focused on the issues that those regions, I think, were working on. Um, and so they're looking at the canal system um, from the perspective of a new, relatively new operator. Um, and the they is the New York State Power Authority. And the Power Authority, you may recall, is the organization that we've been pushing on the Tug Urger uh, and the other historic vessels of the Canal Fleet um, as they're being decommissioned and in some cases auctioned. And I believe at the last meeting we had regarding the Urger, the Power Authority representatives mentioned that at least one listed tug and one eligible tug will be going to auction. Um, the chancellor uh, and I think the chancellor is listed and the grouper is is um, is uh, eligible. So there's been, and, and the urger has been in the last year in dry dock and water for unused. So um, the bottom line here is that it looks to us that the New York State Power Authority is mostly concerned with two things, safety and cost which are both very reasonable. And they have created this reimagined process as a way of looking at this state resource to find a new use for it because they don't feel it's used for its original purpose, which is more commercial transportation, which is also true. Um, however, it's very hard to operate a canal um, and, and have it, it perfectly safe. I mean, it's a canal system. So if that's taken to its logical conclusion, you probably wouldn't want to have locks. You probably wouldn't want to have public act as much uh, uh, people working on it and working on the lift locks and all of those things. And so we kind of see this momentum going in the direction of maybe it shouldn't be operating or segments of it shouldn't be operating any longer. And that really concerns us because we believe that the, the maintaining the, the um, the, the canal as an operable canal system um, not only protects the National Historic Landmark and all of the resources that are associated with it, but maintains it as a heritage tourism uh, 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 resource that's highly unusual for the state of New York. Um, so the lead put together a, a, a white paper. We did, uh, we did state our position. We said it, we felt that it needed to maintain operability as a canal from end to end and that it needed, um, instead of less investment, a greater investment in the heritage tourism um, potential of this to help the municipalities along the canal to better take advantage of this important resource. Um, we've had limited contact with the Power Authority, um, and I think I said in an earlier meeting that I felt that the time uh, was coming where this board might want to consider um, a resolution in support of this Landmark. I think that we should wait and see what the task force uh, comes up with, and if we can get um, wind of that, or if it is made public, and comment on it then. Um, there's um, there's a lot going on with um, with the canal, um, not not the least of which is the Empire State Trail, which is running across the. Uh, length and breadth of New York State, north and, and west, so we'll have a continuous um, bike and recreational trail. The League is working with the Erie Canal and National Heritage Corridor on assessing uh, vacant and underutilized historic buildings along a section of this um, Empire State Trail because we want to promote any new um, development or, um, uh, or cyclist supported uh, 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 businesses. We want them to be focused on the existing buildings and the historic buildings in these communities as opposed to be building new. So if 
there needs to be a bunkhouse, if there needs to be lodging or bicycle services or uh, you know places you can stop mm -hmm. and get your bike fixed or any of that thing, any of those types of things. We want them in these historic buildings. So we feel there's a lot of potential, and we feel that um, that uh, the canal is a wonderful resource for the state and should be um, should be uh, protected moving forward. So. We'll know probably when everyone else knows what this task force comes up. Jay, can I ask you a question? I mean, if you go from Waterford, which has become a real center with the canal, it's a new block to center the falls or Lockport. We've, since I've been involved here, we've spent a lot of money <coughs> through the years, uh, all the way from you know from Waterford out to Buffalo, plus the economic. I mean, there is a there's hundreds of Canadians that use that to come down from Ontario to go south and north and so on. Plus these towns, a lot of them, that's all they've got going for them right now. When you talk about, I would think the political base, both on the congressional level, I mean Paul Tonko on this end, I mean they're not going to sit back with the power authority of the city of New York and just let that thing fly. I mean I think you've got a tremendous <coughs> ground source Every single politician, every mayor, every governmental county along that route, they need to be put on notice quickly, and I'm sure they are, that this could be a, an economic crusher. Uh, and not, I mean, there's an the American cruise line. They use that. There's even more talk. You know, we, were, we were in Europe. Uh, there's so many communities. Uh, all over the, these waterways are absolute economic drivers. And one of the things Bernadette Castro was commissioned, that's all you ever heard about revenue producing, revenue producing. Um, I would think that that is something we should really, really, right across all the rest of the, the park uh, from the Saratoga uh, capital region on out to, to western New York. That should be a rallying point. Uh, that's a serious issue. Yeah, and it is. And I think we've done a lot to meet with the elected representatives. We've done a lot to meet with the politicians and the mayors. And as people continue to get wind of this, they're more and more concerned about it. Uh, but the power authority, we've heard a number of things about safety and about cost. One of the other things that we've, two of the other things we've heard, um, at the Hoosick Hudson Partnership meeting last week, folks from the Power Authority came and they were more concerned about the Champlain Canal, which isn't part of the reimagined yeah. piece. Yeah. And it was really striking to hear how many mayors, um, chambers of commerce, and other representatives stood up and said, this is all about heritage tourism, Absolutely. and we think that the Champlain Canal is the center Absolutely. of development for Schuylerville and for these other Absolutely. communities. And what are you going to do about the Schuylerville? What are you going to do about the Champlain Canal? And how are you going to help us capitalize on it? And that's the same for up and down um, the Erie Canal. But the other thing that we heard there was really the lack of an understanding of the boating community on behalf of the Power yeah. Authority. Yeah. And that they don't seem to want to recognize the level that this canal is used. And we've also heard the canal described by the consultants and by others that kind of surprised us. Um, as um, uh, as uh, something like the High Line that was abandoned yeah. and needed to be reimagined yeah. and found a new use because it wasn't used as a rail line anymore. And you know, we really took issue with that because <laughs> it's not abandoned. Well, and there's a lot of there's a lot of businesses along the canal that really their livelihood is that canal. From an environmental point of view, I can remember that Mohawk River used to be different colors. Different colors from all the garbage and the, the mills that were pouring into that. Fish died. I mean, it went now all up and down. It was it was terrible. You get these people out there, whether they're walking or boating or whatever, they take an environmental interest in the project. And this governor, I mean, I know there's a lot of people that are not only crazy about him. A lot of the areas along upstate North, they haven't always voted for him. But I have to tell you, my, just my opinion, and I'm a non-registered voter, all right? He's done more for upstate New York, and it's done more for parks, and it's done more for, for this region than since, since Nelson Rockefeller was governor. And I mean, I, I think, Whit, would you agree? He has really put, put his, uh, his back to this, and 
you know, I, I feel very passionate about this because my wife and my family, we, have, we own a lot of property on Nantucket, and I know how fast that can slip. And we have live on waterways. We know what it's like. And it's crazy that that river, that going west from Schenectady, to, it's the most historic. You know, you travel out to Utah or Nebraska, I mean, and there's like four corners and some post that three people stopped on the way to Oregon, and they've got a big sign where everybody takes pictures. We got tons of that, tons of it. The maybe farm in Rotterdam. No one ever paid any attention to that place. It's now a mecca. It's on the river. It's on the waterway. Most people complain that they can't get access to the water. Scotia is extremely popular now with boaters, so you take it closer. It, it, I mean, and maybe I'm, maybe it won't be close. Let me let you know how I really from, feel about it. Right, <laughs> from the house, from the, we've heard that, it could, that sections of it could be uh, uh, closed. We've heard all different kinds That's of nuts. things, but everything we're hearing is rumor because they don't, you know, they, don't, they don't have us included. In I'm in a business about uh, you know tragedies, accidents, and so on. You have a greater chance of slipping and falling in a bank than you do uh, the Erie Canal. And I said, look at the statistics. Look at the numbers. You know, it's, it's, it's a they, stupid if, excuse. If, if they want to get out of the business of, uh, of dangerous uh, activities, mm -hmm. they should close every electric generating plant. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's preposterous. Now, are there any elected officials on this study? Uh, there, I mean, uh, or is it all? Not a, I don't think electeds. Do you know that? Oh, Joni. Yeah. Joni. Douglas County. Uh, yeah. But I mean, that's. Yeah, right. So that's. That's right. It's not much. It's not much. Uh, because I think it's very important to recruit. To, uh, obviously, this board can't do it, but the league can, and, and the uh, support group for the, for the Canal uh, Recreation Commission should be talking to all these mayors and state legislators. Uh, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a depressing thing. The governor is, is pretty familiar with this, not only because of, of the new trail uh, promotion, but also as, as HUD secretary, he was, he was paying attention to the canal communities mm -hmm. and in some ways that made us a little more comfortable, perhaps. Um, but he certainly is familiar with it as a, as a system. And, uh, now well, let's hope that the right thing comes to pass. We'll keep watching and we can yeah. keep, the, keep the board informed. Yeah. Just for the record, the agency's participation in the task force has been uh, termed confidential at my first request. So I'm not going to comment. Uh, you know, I could do a one blink yes, two blink no. That's <laughs> more my questions. His mother's favorite child, you can see that. Um, the legislature, as I understand it, was just briefed yesterday by night, uh, by phone, um, and uh, uh, you know, the final task force meeting is Thursday in Syracuse, and uh, you know, Commissioner's not here now, but Commissioner will be at the award ceremony, and he and I are leaving immediately at 3 for a meeting with Mike uh, this afternoon. So, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's the end of the process. And, I just want to report on the Aldrich and Gray building, which um, you remember that you rejected the building in Buffalo, the Apple building, and the sponsor did appeal to the National Park Service, but the National Park Service supported your decision and rejected the appeal. And it was a very simple letter that said, it doesn't have enough integrity. If you want to see it, I can forward it to you. That'd be great. Uh, um, does everyone want to see it, or just want to send it to everyone? It was a really simple, short letter. Yeah, we'll just, to see it. And uh, what I had sent them at their at Park Service's request was um, a link to the board meeting, to the YouTube video. And, a, and so the reviewer in Washington will actually watch the board meeting and your review of it. Um, and the, the sponsor's presentation, and then of course she had the nominate what the appeal person appealing is supposed to submit 
the, the nomination that she prepared, which what she did. Mm -hmm. And then um, I submitted our, the comments I gave to you and right. the review board, the link to the review board meeting, which she watched, and then she made her decision and just simply said, it doesn't have enough integrity. She didn't go into a lot of detail, but I will send you all the letter if you'd like to read it. Kat, thank you for bringing that up. I, I did have a copy of the letter here, oh. just to reference, but I appreciate that you brought it up first. Um, you know, we have 75 nominations on the agenda this year, 74 advanced, one did not. That's obviously a very rare situation uh, in any given year, let alone over a, large, a longer period of time. Um, the letter notes the draft nomination <coughs> nomination and supplemental materials supplied by your organization. This is a letter to Carrie Trainer. Do not counter the state and state review board's decision that the Aldrich and Ray Manufacturing Building no longer retains sufficient integrity for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. A loss of the north half of the building in 1976 was too much for the final small industrial complex in Buffalo to retain sufficient integrity for listing on the National Register. So kudos to staff in preparing um, you know, the material, a very careful evaluation, a lot of groupthink that would happen. Uh, you know, Julian and, and Kat both extensively involved uh, in, in reviewing the, the staff's information. But finally, you know, your, your, your process, your participation in this process, your questions, uh, your review of that nomination was critical. And so it's a very unusual circumstance, but in this case, uh, certainly the National Park Service uh, seconded your, your take. So thank you for that. Um, we have, uh, I want to note that we do have a number of staff uh, in the room uh, from uh, the survey unit. I want to pass out um, a map of the new territorial assignments for your use and reference, I do want uh, staff, we sort of have a, a elementary school square dance situation here. We have the NR staff on one side of the room, we have the survey staff <laughs> on the other side of the room. I promise by March, everyone will be sitting together. Um, but if, if the survey staff uh, would please introduce themselves, um, if you would perhaps introduce yourselves in the context of your new territory, or maybe that, that's a little complex. But Erin, if we could just start with you, would you introduce yourself? And, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, I'm Erin Cernicky, and I'm in the survey unit. Um, if you want me to talk about the uh, territory that I will be taking over, it's Mohawk Valley and Schoharie Valley area. Um, I'm familiar with these territories. I've been in charge of uh, central New York for the last couple of years. So most of these counties are counties that I've been working in compliance for for the last couple of years. Yeah. James? I'm Jamie Spinelli. I've been with the office for four years, but I've been with uh, parks since 2008 with the historic sites. Um, I'll be taking over central New York, the Syracuse area. Um, and that's about it. I'm Daniel Bagro. Um, I am covering the uh, northern port of, uh, portion of New York, um, and I've been with the agency for about 12 years, uh, previously in the archaeology unit and now about a year in the survey evaluation unit, and uh, I've done one nomination before, so I'm looking forward to doing more. Tell them which one it was. Uh, the Space Shuttle oh, Enterprise. Right. <laughs> All right. did a fabulous nomination. Uh, my name is James Carter. This is actually my first day. Uh, I currently work for uh, Parks. I work in the budget office, but I'll be taking over at the uh, Albany area, so Albany, Rensselaer, and the Green and Columbia counties. Thank you, James. Hi, I'm Linda Mackey, um, and I've been with Shippo for six and a half years. I started with both gens as part of my training. I think I prepared five nominations. That was in a couple of meetings. And I'll be, um, well, I've been doing New York City, Long Island, and a couple of aging for the past few years, but I'll be focusing my NRM survey on New York City, except for Queens. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Jennifer. Yeah, I just need to tell you. I'm Jennifer. Um, I'll have Queens and Long Island. Uh, Virginia Bartis, and I'm taking, well, uh, previously had the finger legs, and now I'm taking a step to the left. <coughs> My territory will be the Genesee area, which means um, we will still be covering Rochester. That's great. I'm Jennifer, uh, the other Jennifer, and I will be staying with Western New York. You haven't seen the end of me, I saw how some stuff is working. I hire any of them with my money, too. I think they're all swell. You're the money. best. Okay, final point of business of board business will be future meeting dates. Okay, so um, 
only slightly complicated, but uh, with the dates I sent out were March 19th, June 11th, September 10th, and December 3rd. Everyone was okay with all of them, except for Kristen, who cannot make the March and June ones. So I can make the June one work, but then March 19th. Oh, you can make June that? Well, I can make it, it's, I can make that one work. Okay. It's not ideal for me, but June is the well, it's not ideal for me, so I will make that one work, but the okay. 19th. So I, then the choice, is, well. Or I would have to leave um, one either, train. Well, there's no point in leaving at noon, because yeah. that would, that's, that's my point. That's that's that would, so that makes me feel a little bit better. You can either miss a meeting, since everyone yeah. else can come. I didn't want you to have to miss two meetings. Yeah. Or you can choose to meet on a date one week earlier or one week later. Or one day earlier one week day later. Um, what do you, what would you board members like to do? Do, do you have 10 of the 11 on the 19th? Am I the only one? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so I have, you're the only one who can't come. Everyone else could come on all, all the dates. Um, except for, I don't okay. think Paul, I don't think Paul, was, Paul did not respond to the email. The only thing about, I'm sorry, the only thing about that, uh, Wayne, so uh, DC Lobby Days is the week before, oh, right. and the state uh, state right. conference is the week right. after. So it would be difficult right. to change right. that date. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's this is the yeah. March 19th date. Yeah. So it would be difficult to change that one. So if, yeah, you, let's don't, keep it. if you don't so mind, Miss, I didn't want you to have to miss no, half I the meetings. That. I just have to be. Yeah. But you yeah. can't okay. you. There's no other way. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I'll see. Okay. Uh, June, I will make June. So March 19, June 11, September 10, yeah. December 3. Yeah. Those are 2020. And we had, we, had, we had not met on the Thursday, which is tomorrow, for Lucy. Is it, mm -hmm. But then she didn't mm -hmm. come, so I don't, I don't, she didn't ask us not to do it next year. And okay. I think she'll, All right, so we've settled on dates. That's the last piece of board business. Shall we move to adjourn before we eat lunch? Wit? Well, I think that I'm kind of something that I'm going to do to up. All right. <laughs> let, me, let me begin by saying uh, that the reorganization and the reassignment is particularly stressful for our friend, the executive secretary. And uh, we should be conscious of that. Um, and uh, she is very conscious of it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this is a moment of, of transition, and it should be recognized. And I've uh, been asked to, and, and with with uh, that bittersweet pleasure, uh, have drafted a, uh, a resolution for consideration by the board. Uh, and uh, you can either leave the vote or not cap, as you as you see said. And let's respect uh, Kat's feelings uh, about all of this. Whereas Kathleen Moore Frank, having served the New York State uh, Historic Preservation Office with great distinction for 48 years, is truly the doyen of this state's historic preservation program. And whereas Ms. Moore Frank has brought incomparable fidelity, professional knowledge, and collegiality to the successive assignments she has completed with assiduity and skill, most recently as supervisor of the National Register Unit since, 19, uh, since 2011, and whereas she has long been our resident authority on the procedures of the National Park Service and the criteria applied to National Register nominations, and has thus assured our almost always prevailing in the rare instances of problematic nominations advanced to the NPS. And whereas during these past eight years, Ms. LaFranc has shepherded 740 nominations onto the register, representing thousands of individual buildings, thereby making many eligible for rehabilitation tax credits and preservation grants, and thus helping to reduce the carbon footprint and improve the economy and quality of life for all New Yorkers. And whereas she has been a key actor in keeping New York State in its accustomed place, annually leading the states in the competition for most properties listed on the National Register for the current count of 6,075, 12% of which have been listed during tenure in her current post. And whereas Ms. LaFranc has personally written numerous complicated and criteria-stretching nominations 
such as those for the site of the Woodstock Music Festival, the Urban Renewal Inspired Uncle Sam Atrium in Troy, and the Taconic and Palisades Interstate Parkways, and has taken the lead in advancing nominations relating to properties associated with underrepresented communities and the LBGTQ history. And whereas she is justly acknowledged to be a writer of rare talent, a master of clarity and fluency in the English language, who uh, was the author of the 11-page entry on the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation and its history for the Encyclopedia of New York State, published in 2005, and has now been asked to undertake a fuller history of the agency to be published in 2024 on the occasion of the centennial of Robert Moses' State Parks Plan. And whereas Ms. LaFranc has ever been ready to be a caring and inspiring mentor to younger colleagues and a, coll a collegiate worker with others on the team. Now, therefore, the New York State Board for Historic Preservation hereby resolves to recognize with gratitude and affection the devoted and talented public service of Kathleen LaFranc and her accomplishments and personal qualities as described above Noting in particular her efficient work as coordinator of the quarterly meetings of this board and our executive secretary, and to wish her further success in her distinguished career at the agency, happy that she will continue to make her mark in our midst. Accept the resolution. Yes. Tom Max, seconded by Wayne. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, thank you for your um, understanding of this too significant transition uh, on our staff. It's, it's one that. Uh, has an impact on CAF, on, on others. Um, I think we have uh, the work we would like CAF to switch focus to is extraordinarily important for the agency. Uh, it is about uh, providing this agency with its history, never before summarized or, or uh, collated in, in one place, never a history celebrated uh, by publication, never a history that is, has been fully in place to inform compliance and capital funding decisions. Uh, and so, um, at NOR, will CAF be leading the uh, program uh, she will be working with and around in a number of different ways, from both training the newly merged unit uh, to um, undertaking further NR nominations, NHLs, and there may be she has a very, uh, has been offered a very full and uh, very full new assignment, but it is a difficult assignment to transition to, uh, and obviously that's uh, something we're seeing today, and some of you have reached out and had earlier conversations with her about it. So I appreciate the support of offering to her, um, and uh, uh, know that that will need to continue. Um, I do also want to recognize um, uh, two, um, two state, uh, state preservation office uh, staff, uh, Cordell Reeves, who is here. Cordell, if you just stand for a moment. I received the Distinguished Service Award from the agency uh, last, uh, earlier this uh, last month, late last month, uh, for uh, uh, his um, commitment to pushing our agency uh, to be more fluent in a wider range of, um, of histories and perspectives. Um, Cordell works with the interpretive unit under Greg Smith's uh, direction and uh, is just a key compass for uh, our staff, our, uh, our future work, uh, our, our current and future work. Uh, and Cordell, I also appreciate it. <laughs> Service Award, uh, going to the Huddleston, the uh, Huddleston Awards. Uh, not here, 
um, to be recognized, but uh, uh, Aaron Maroney uh, on our Bureau of Historic Sites staff uh, received a special service award for her uh, innovative uh, treatments uh, on historic fabric uh, and um, uh, restoration at the Stato Mansion, including projects involving 3D printing and laser scanning uh, to uh, reinstall components of the historic fabric. So we were also very pleased to see, um, see uh, uh, her, her efforts recognized at the eighth highest level in the agency. So Cordell and Aaron deserve uh, your recognition. So um, thank you. I went to the Skyler House recently, and I was just blown away by the, uh, some of these new mm -hmm. approaches to interpretation that, that uh, helps enormously uh, put us back in the uh, one, one last thing. Oops, one other addition to our staff um, recently is Lovada Mahan, who I just wanted to quickly uh, acknowledge Lovada as well. We've added her to our interpretive staff. And um, she, I first met Lovada working at one of our sites doing a program and was immediately impressed by not only her presentation, but also her level of knowledge, the research she does. She has done some programs at some of our other facilities, and then suddenly we started talking about, hey, you know, could we bring Levada on board and have access to her expertise and knowledge every day? And Levada joined us uh, two weeks ago? Yeah. Two wow. weeks ago. So we're, we're really thrilled to have her on board. And I'll just say, uh, staff transitions are never easy. So, um, you know, we certainly appreciate the deliberations that have to go into something mm -hmm. like that. And I think it's just important for the staff to know that uh, the state portal, you know, supports them. Absolutely. Uh, and we have the utmost faith in, in all of you and think you do a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. So, You're here. Uh, we're, we're all here to, uh, to support you and we look forward to working with you. Excellent. Well said. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. So moved. I think we're in agreement there. Watch.